Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Thor Nolan, and I am a solutions architect working in the AWS partner ecosystem. And before we listen to Netflix talk about the optimiz optimization and performance of their Amazon Linux, or excuse me, of their Linux AMIs, wanted to spend a few moments and talk about a few emerging considerations that you need to think about when selecting your Linux AMI in the AWS ecosystem. The Linux ecosystem at Amazon EC2 is really around customer choice and ease of use. Regardless of the Linux distribution or the Linux version that you're looking to use, we want to make sure that the ease of deployment is better in the AWS EC2 environment than, than it is in any other type of deployment arena that you could be using. On the retail side, Amazon.com has the concept of frustration-free packaging. And we want to ensure with Amazon EC2 that we're offering a frustration-free experience with the deployment of your Linux AMIs. We want to believe that it should be very easy for you to deploy Linux, but also to be able to reproduce that environment, to continue to update and manage that environment, and to do so in a high-performing fashion. So when you deploy a solution in AWS, you probably first decide on the operating system and version that you're going to use, probably based upon application requirements and uh, historic selection, uh, historic preference. Probably the second consideration you're going to make is the actual EC2 instance type. And this is one of the areas where we'd like to emphasize that you need to think beyond just the initial choice, but also consider that this is something that you should evaluate and in an ongoing fashion revisit and make sure you've selected the correct one. It's common to choose that initial uh, EC2 instance based upon already established requirements for your applications, or perhaps you are going to translate CPU and memory profile from an existing native install or an existing virtual deployment. Um, sometimes we even see the primary consideration be the cost of the particular instance type involved. But what we see all too often is that once that initial decision on an instance type is made, that the customers tend to stick with it, even when evidence sort of is there that maybe they should think beyond that. So often enough, customers have this initial instance type that they've selected, and they are running on the edge of the available resources that that particular instance type makes available to them. And so that is fine probably for 90% of their workload, 90% of the time. But during critical peak periods where performance is a requirement, you can start to see issues occur. The, you can take and enable best practices with CloudWatch, with auto-scaling, the best practices associated with elasticity, but there is also a best practice associated with understanding how to performance tune your Linux AMI, and then how to monitor, measure that, and continue to revisit this in an ongoing fashion to ensure that you have selected an instance type that doesn't meet your needs 90% of the time, but meets them 100% of the time. So the Amazon EC2 team continues to develop new instance types. We've launched a few of them this month, a few of them just yesterday. Uh, until just over a year ago, that instance type decided which version of, of the AMI pools that you had a selection from, because that instance type was either going to support HVM, or a hardware virtual machine, or it would support PV, or a para-virtual machine. And there were no, no instance types that actually supported both. With the instance types that we have now released, we have M3, HI1, I2, the HS1, and the C3. So now we have five instance types that support both PV and HVM AMIs. So now we have an emerging choice, an emerging consideration that wasn't always present before. So when it comes to PV or para-virtualization, this is a simple environment where the operating system itself has the introduction of drivers, which makes it essentially aware that it is virtualized. The lucky thing is in the Linux ecosystem, almost all stock Linux kernels today come with these para-virtualization drivers already in the kernel existing. With hardware virtualization, you're actually leveraging the virtualization support that's built into the CPU. So you can use unmodified operating systems. However, we do have this capability within HVM 
the pair virtualization drivers, as I said, are built into the Linux kernel, and actually in an HVM Linux AMI, you can make use of these, and you get better performance out of network and storage. So if by chance you are using a Linux AMI that doesn't have PV, um, PV drivers built into it, and you want to use it in an HVM arena, it is highly recommended that you introduce those drivers. So with our i2 and C3 instance types recently released, we have also the capability to offer enhanced networking. Now, this requires the introduction of Intel drivers, and it is in the HVM only type of arena, although those drivers are completely harmless and non-functional if they're used in a PV type of environment. However, the Intel drivers are not commonly available on all Linux distributions right now, and so you will have to download, compile, install those drivers, and we do provide instructions for all of this online. So which is it? Are we suggesting PV or HVM or HVM with PV drivers? Even if you have experience with Zen environments in other areas, in other environments outside of AWS, you want to consider that there are going to be some differences that you will see in the way that PV and HVM actually work and react here. The only way that we're really recommending that you determine your selection between PV or HVM is to determine some metrics that you can measure, you can test, and then you can evaluate and make that choice. Ultimately, the application and the workload testing that you do is going to be the only thing that can really functionally guide you to make the best determination for the virtualization model that, that best suits your needs. On the partner ecosystem side, we're spending a lot of time with our infrastructure partners to ensure that we have a larger selection of HVM AMIs. Today, the catalog is substantially smaller for HVM AMIs than it is for PV AMIs. And so that's something that we're working with our partners to ensure that we're expanding that functionality and, and we want to make sure that uh, we're offering that to our customers. As with most things that we do, that requires customer feedback. So whether it be right here, whether it be in the forums, please do make known your requirements, what you need from a, a version as well as a distribution for HVM use as you start to take advantage of these, these new instance types. So that is basically the, uh, the input that we wanted to put out there. I think right now what we need to do is pass it over to uh, Coburn Watson from Netflix who can talk about Linux optimization and performance. All right, thanks Thor. Cool, welcome. On the last day here at the conference. Hope you can hear me okay. Um, so I guess we're good to go. So yeah, I'm here to talk to you about uh, tuning your Linux AMI um, and how we look at it. So I'm Coburn Watson. I manage the cloud performance team at Netflix. Um, if you haven't heard of Netflix, this might be your first session at the conference, but uh, uh, we've had a few. So we have a lot of customers. We stream a lot of movies. Um, and we have some notables. The, uh, our originals catalogs really has been growing, so hopefully everybody's Got high anticipation about all of our second season coming out. I know, I know I am. So one thing I wanted to do was set some context around uh, how we view AMI performance at Netflix, right? We have a lot of instances running out there, and why is it something that's important for us to address? So you've already heard that we, um, you know, we have tens of thousands of instances running globally for Netflix uh, in a given day, right? And when you start operating at that bit of a higher scale, you have the sort of rising tide lifts all ships models, right? So in the organization itself, most service teams, we have about 30 engineering teams that push code to production independently. Uh, they push on top. I'm going to talk about our base AMI um, in a second. But basically, the performance team is responsible for a holistic view of the environment and, and making sure that we're using our resources efficiently. We have a large range of workloads in our environment, probably not uncommon for most of you. Um, I use the term OLTP a lot. I'm told it's becoming pretty old, and I probably shouldn't use it. But you know, think of um, you know, user-facing applications and other services, which tend to be pretty latency-sensitive. And then we have batch or pre-compute. So you know, Netflix has this luxury of a very large catalog of titles, many, many tens of thousands. And when you come to visit us, I can only put 30 or so pictures on your screen to show which ones I think you should play. And so we recently have moved to a batch or pre-compute model. So just about every day we revisit what you've seen, you know, what your preferences are, what other people look at, and we update your recommendations each day. And it's, we've seen it improve some of our viewership, um, and we've gotten good feedback on it, so hopefully you guys are seeing that as well. But from a workload perspective, it's very different from the majority of our other services. 
Uh, and then Cassandra and EDCache, so we have our data storage tiers, and they themselves have very distinct workloads. You know, Cassandra tends to be very I.O. intensive in our case, uh, depending on the cluster. We have about 50 of them. And then EBCache is mostly, uh, you know, memory and network heavy systems. And I put this out here. This isn't anything like a dig on AWS, but, you know, whether it's virtualization in general or it's running on the cloud, you know, I think we're all aware that we'll have more inherent variability in the environment, right? It's just, it's, it's the way of the world, right? We have an incredible flexibility to deploy whatever we want, whenever we want. Um, and for that, we're giving up a little bit of control about performance. I do think a lot of the new instance types, you know, talking about the Intel optimized drivers, I mean, the bit rates I've heard and the latency reductions, it's gonna be amazing what it provides in general in terms of the, the quality of the system and the fact that they're now exposing the CPU you're on. You have a much better understanding of what you're actually running on the environment, which is awesome. Um, and then, in our case, you know, we have so many thousands of instances, if we had to individually configure them to gain performance benefits, it would be a real pain in the ass. So, we have an open source project called Aminator that you guys might have heard of. It's really our bakery pipeline. It's, it's on the Netflix uh, GitHub site. And what it does is it allows us to create a pipeline for prepping application AMIs. I was in a VPC presentation a couple days ago, and one of the best practices they talked about was when you're bootstrapping your AMI, that's when maybe you would pull in some packages, you have greater flexibility. Um, you know, the downside is it re uh, increases your startup time, right? So we really can't afford that uh, in our environment. So what we do is you basically will take like a distribution AMI, you pull it into your account, um, and then you'll create what's called a foundation AMI because then you can create snapshots off that EBS root volume. And then on top of that, we have what we call a base AMI. And so we have an engineering tools team they work on the monkeys that you've heard about. Um, they maintain the base SAMI. They're actually looking for someone who wants to um, own the base SAMI, so if you guys are interested in that, let me know. Um, and then, once you create that base SAMI, we change that less frequently. That includes things on top of the foundation AMI, like the version of Java, uh, Tomcat, Apache, system monitoring utilities. And so, as an engineering team in Netflix, when you build your application through Jenkins, it basically starts with the base SAMI as a template and pops your package on top of that and then registers on Amazon as a distinct uh, AMI for your application. So when your group is auto-scaling up or down, you're creating new ASGs, it's all ready to go. There's no additional configuration that happens at bootstrap time. And so by having this level of customization available to us, we can sneak in a bunch of little things that we want to, right? I mean, a lot of teams don't want to worry about tuning various things at the network or the kernel layer uh, related to that. So we can put in Apache and Tomcat configurations on the base AMI, things that are tweaked for various workloads or just best practices in general. Um, and then if we want workload-specific applications, and I will be completely honest, this is something that we've just started looking at heavily this year. So thinking about the concept of roles, and really we had the base AMI and we have the application, which is from more generalized to completely specific in its nature, and we're now playing around with how we're going to incorporate these various roles, like you're a pre-compute application, you're an OLTP application, and sort of shuffling along the changes with them, but that's something we're currently working on. And maybe that'll make its way into Aminator as an additional sort of configuration dimension. So tuning the Linux kernel. Um, some of these are probably self-evident, but uh, I think to Thor's point, when you select an instance, we all have different parameters on which we select instances. You know, in some cases, Amazon, we have so many instances that we, um, we maintain few relatively large instance pools, right? So if you were to look at M22XLs, maybe they're 70% of our footprint, right? And a lot of teams might be running on an instance that's not ideal for their workload. It's typically a little bit bigger, but given we're operating with mostly reserved instances, it's required, right? We can't say, hey, here's 50 instances, just pick and pull what you want, because tomorrow we could be on 500 CC2s or something, right, that we don't have reservations for. Um, but we still evaluate what instance class, and I think the new models that came out are new instance classes, um, families that were announced, are give, gonna give us a lot more flexibility on that. But in general, when you go out and look at your environment, um, and you go to an instance and you see people auto-scaling or sizing their ASGs, the assumption is, is that they're sizing it for a specific reason. They're pushing some dimension on that instance. You know, we have a lot of movie data, so we have a lot of instances that require a lot of RAM, because it has to be served from in memory. And so, you need to evaluate that over time. Things change a lot in Netflix. Someone refactors the movie library and suddenly the heap footprint goes down quite a bit and it opens up a whole new set of categories of instances they can move to, and we allow that to happen. Um, it can happen all the time, but for large movements we tend to uh, focus that a little bit. Um, at the scale we're at, and I pointed that out before with the rising tide lifts all ships, when we start talking about improving efficiencies at scale, if I get another two to 5% out of you know, 5,000 instances, it's a pretty big gain for us and it's, there's really no need not, not to do it. 
Um, and going through the tuning process, I think, it gets you more in touch with what your application is doing on your AMI. A lot of people say, well, here's my throughput, or my performance sucks, or my response time just went in the hole. You know? And that's great, but really what you want to do is, in our environment, it's pretty cool, because all engineers basically have root access to all the systems in production at any time. So if I want to go look at the performance characteristics of a box, I can just go onto it and do packet captures, whatever I want. It's great. Um, but you have the ability to look at the performance of your application and its demands on the systems, and that's the next two points. Um, I think the performance tooling around Linux has been improving significantly, probably more in the past decade, but you have a ton of tools available to you. You know, If you're not lucky enough to be running on a, on a platform that perhaps supports a D-Trace, um, there's still some really good other solutions like Perf and SystemTap that run on Linux, and they continue to mature. And Perf and SystemTap are some of the ones that we use pretty heavily. Um, and doing the tuning gets you an understanding of what your application demands of your operating system, and then you can also just do a bottom-up analysis. Like, I don't even know what the application's doing. I just want to go look at the resource utilization of my system and determine what the point of contention is, and then I can go work with the other team. But by getting in touch with your performance at the kernel level, I think it's, it's really eye-opening uh, for most people. Now, there are a lot of trade-offs. So, well, I have three here. But, um, you know, the kernel systems are interdependent, right? And I've seen people... I was a sysadmin a long time ago in my life. Um, and so I've seen people tweak a lot of things where they didn't necessarily validate the benefit or make sure that it was appropriate for all workloads, right? So we're extremely careful in our tuning. We're applying something that could be inherited by hundreds of services deployed within days across tens of thousands of instances. And so we take it pretty heavily in terms of if we change this, what does it mean for our other workloads? So we sort of start by with the role, the role model. And then the 80-20 rule. So I don't know if anybody's ever worked on applications that use like an RDMS or RDBMS or a database, but you know, you'll have a performance problem. Someone will say this, this response time's slow. And you typically don't want to go off and start looking at the kernel configuration of the database server and say, well, maybe I need to tune I.O., right? Because what you'll probably find is there's some query missing an index that's doing like 10 gazillion reads when it could be doing like 10. And so the benefits you'll get in terms of tuning your application versus your, uh, your operating system you know, there's a pretty big spread there. So the assumption is, like us, we've already gone through a fairly iterative process of tuning our applications. We have a bunch of very senior engineers that have, you know, decades of experience on distributed systems. And our assumption is they're applying the best practices we circulate. They tune their application stack. And we're now at a point where we're actually going to start looking at the AMI. And this is something we did a lot uh, this year. And then back to the first point. Once you tailor your AMI for a certain workload, it doesn't work for everybody, right? So you could actually cause more problem um, more harm than good, I guess would be the term. Um, and this was from uh, someone on my team. So you really just want to align your system resources to what your application needs of the system over time. And if you switch instance types, you'll obviously have to revisit that again. But it should be a somewhat infrequent thing you have to do. Um, we're actually working on building some scripts and wrappers around perf and system taps so that we can deploy it on all of our AMIs and proactively sort of on the fly enable the type of instrumentation to determine where contention is. So performance tools, I'm just gonna talk about this real quick. Um, this could be a whole day discussion on itself. We look at the primary dimensions for performance just like I'm sure you guys do as well, CPU, memory, network I.O., block I.O. And then scalability is thrown in there, right? In production we have a problem where we tend to see the workload going up on a system or the request rate, and we see performance start to not look ideal. But we look at the system level, and there's almost no resource that we're typically used to seeing be saturated, be saturated. Most of the time, this will drive us back into application tuning. But if it doesn't, then we just keep diving down, going down the rabbit hole on where the time is spent on the system. So there's all the basic tools, right? Everybody's familiar with all these tools. Like, oh, I get on the system, where what's happening? And you do a VM stat, and you're like, look, my CPU is completely idle. Um, I have a real high level of context switches, you know, very relative term. But these are the ones you would use just at a broad sweep to say, well, what's happening in my system at a very high level? And then once you've actually determined, hopefully these tools will lead you down the path of um, what you sort of want to look at. And there's tools, and there's also, you know, proc, um, file system structures that provide some of this data, some of them network, some of them CPU. But it, we all use these, I think, as an entry point. But sometimes it can be frustrating. Like, oh, I, run, I ran it, and I can see that I'm really hammering the CPU. But I seem to be, I have a real high system CPU load, right? Why is my, why is my application putting so much load on the kernel uh, system side? And so then you start using your advanced tools, right, where you start. Some of them are optimized, like block trace for looking at your I.O. patterns, slab tops for kernel memory. Um, I think system to happen perf here on the next page. But you know, Wireshark, TCP dump, you really start digging into things. So the advanced tools are where 
you've got a high level sense of where you might have some inefficiencies, um, but then what you want to do is you want to dive a little bit deeper. Get some water here. Uh, and then perp and system tap. We did have dtrace on here before, but um, you know, if you aren't running on an operating system that has a dtrace, which we currently are not on, um, I didn't really want to call it out. Uh, but yeah, there's just a variety of tooling. So now I'm going to go on to the actual AMI tuning. So I'm sort of a proxy here today, just so you know. The Linux uh, tuning expert on my team wasn't able to make it, so he generated this. I think I'm pretty up to date on it, but if there's really any hardcore questions that come up later, I'm going to have to defer to him. Amr was not able to make it here today. He actually teaches classes on Linux system performance tuning and kernel development, so I am not Amr, but I will, I will make a best, best effort attempt here. So when we started looking at where, you know, now, assume that prior to this year, there was really no focused AMI tuning effort going on at Netflix, and we finally got to a point where, you know, this is a pretty big rock that we haven't um, turned over yet, right? So I got someone on my team who's a specialist in this area, and we started looking at, in the different categories of tunables at the Linux operating system level, or kernel level, what could bring us the biggest value? Um, and as I talked about, we had differentiated workloads, so a real a uh, low-hanging one to go after was our batch, or pre-compute workload, right? They, they tend to consume many thousands of instances at a time, running at probably 95 or above percent utilization on CPU, just crunching through a bunch of data. And so, you know, the um, completely fair scheduler, which came in, I think, around 2623, somewhere in that time frame, it was a pretty radical change to the CPU scheduling capabilities on the Linux uh, system, on the Linux kernel. And it really focuses on being fair, as it says in the name, right? So applications, I think it tends to favor primarily interactive-based applications. Everybody gets a fair share of CPU time. It changed how the CPU time was apportioned. It's purely based on like nanosecond allocation versus some other mechanism that sort of required some jiggery at the, uh, the OS level. So we took the, the batch application, which were running at high CPU utilization everywhere, and we evaluated what it would do how we could get more time on the CPU for the batch application itself, right? So if you don't tune CFS at all, and you happen to be a batch-based application that's very CPU intensive in this case, you end up getting preempted a lot, and there's a lot of involuntary context switches where the, sed the scheduler basically says, okay, you've used your very tiny slice of CPU, now I'm gonna kick you off, and then you're waiting, you're trying to get back on, so there's a lot more context switching going on than necessary. And the tunables that are listed here, those are the defaults that are calculated uh, based on the number of cores in your system, so it's dynamic in nature. So you have two basic approaches you can take. You can basically change the scheduling priority of the process um, to be batch, or you can actually change it at a system-wide level, and that affects all processes on your system, right? So the first one there determines when you actually get on CPU, um, how much time you're allocated to consume, right? And I think it's, it says 18 milliseconds, that's incorrect. But we actually double that. It actually d defines, you know, the amount of time you get when you're on CPU, and then additionally, it the second one defines a time window over which the fair scheduler is going to try to make sure that all processes in the queue waiting for CPU will actually get to the CPU. So you can sort of simulate the batch type scheduling model. If you set your priority of your process uh, to batch, what happens is um, you get preempted less frequently. You get more time when you're on CPU. You know, you get on there, you have to warm your CPU caches, you've got all your data. You just start doing some work and then you get kicked out the door, right? Which isn't great for, for throughput overall. Um, and then you can set it manually, as I said, at a broad system level. We're still playing around with how we want to apply this change, if we want to actually apply it to the process itself, the Java process, or we want to affect scheduling of all processes on the system in terms of how we're gonna incorporate that in there. Um, our services tend to be pretty single tenant, so a batch application is a batch application, and there really shouldn't be a lot of interactive activity going on on there. Um, you can use tools like uh, PID stat. So this is a case where maybe you identify that you have like um, a high context switch rate and you're trying to determine if your application can get more efficient use of CPU. And so I think the third column or the general, the context switch is which are voluntary, right? Our application obviously has to get on there and go get some data, makes a network or a disk you know, request and it gets kicked off the CPU voluntarily. And then you have the involuntary context switches, and those are basically you being kicked off of the CPU by someone else needing to get on the CPU and the scheduler feeling like you've had enough of your, your slice. So after applying this change on our pre-compute -comp workload, you can see that our involuntary context switches drop significantly on the batch application for all the Java process threads. Um, and we got about a two to 5% increase in throughput. You know, there was some variability there. You know, our data uh, has very different dimensions, so it isn't completely point time. And we're doing this in production, so we actually had real data going through, which was nice. We just picked one instance out of the, the thousand or so. 
But this is where you use some of the additional advanced tooling to get a sense of, you know, where is that process spending at time, its time? Why is it getting kicked off CPU so much? So one thing I didn't mention is this is all mileage may vary. You know, don't go home and, like, apply a bunch of this stuff um, and then find that it breaks things. Um, it does come back to what Thor said, where you really have to understand what it does to your, your application system. So that's, that's the only thing we've done in the domain of looking at our CPU scheduling algorithm. And we feel like right now, for our batch tier, that's really the only one that's going to benefit from it. But we're going to be applying that in general to the majority of our, um, our pre-compute workload. So the next one is page cache tuning. And we came, we came to look at this one um, as a result of doing performance analysis on Cassandra, right? So we, as we go from these various workloads, we try to identify the subset of uh, kernel parameters, which could benefit us for that specific workload based on their behavior. Um, and so Amr identified some that we were going to look at for Cassandra because it has an extremely high I.O. rate. You know, we're, we're one of the larger consumers probably of the high one for X large instances for SSD purposes. You know, a lot of people are watching movies. Um, we're storing their bookmarks. There's a lot of data coming back to us. I think of the 30 or so percent of bandwidth, could we, bandwidth we consume on the Internet each night, probably about 3 to 4 percent of that is actually inbound. That's data coming to Netflix around your bookmarks, your concurrency, your streams, your recommendations. So um, Cassandra has to write all of that out. The good news is Cassandra is very good at writing stuff out um, and, and accepting inserts, right? It's really, I think it was built to support comments at Twitter or something. Not my area of expertise. Uh, Christos from our team, uh, the CD team, knows a lot about that. But what you want to do is if you're in a situation um, where there's an application writing very heavily through your page cache, you know, if you're an application like Oracle, you're probably calling a sync and you're flushing all your data down to that redo log immediately. A lot of, you know, more current applications like, say, Cassandra or services, they don't necessarily force synchronous writes every write, right? They're replicating to other nodes in the cluster. You have a certain level of, you know, quorum. You, you feel comfortable that you can avoid a small loss of data for the purpose of performance um, and availability. And so Cassandra will be writing to the page cache, and then it will do um, a flush uh, periodically. So the default configuration of the page cache is not ideal for a bunch of workloads that have heavy write characteristics, and you'll have very bursty I.O. behavior. So one of the settings is dirty ratio. And I didn't mean to qualify that these, aren't, these actually aren't the fully qualified tunables, right? To fit them on a slide, we cut all that off. So this might be like um, you know, VM, memory, whatever, something like that. So you have to go look those up yourself. But the dirty ratio specifies um, the percentage of the page cache, which is allowed to have dirty pages before your process or a process that's trying to write into the page cache is responsible for flushing its own buffers. And so you can have an application that's just bursting ahead. And the default's 10, right? So once you get to 10% of your dirty pages on a lot of distributions, um, your process will have to stop doing the work it wants to do, like writing to the buffer cache, and it'll have to start pushing its buffers down to the file system um, itself. And so it's like a hiccup you don't really need. So what we do is we say, you know, let us have a larger amount of dirty pages um, in memory. And then to overcome the limitation of that, you know, you think, well, that's great if I'm adding all this additional space to write data to, but eventually it's going to catch up to me and kill me, right? Because at some point I'm going to have to write it out. So again, you have to understand your workload, but the, uh, you know, the PD flush or the kernel flusher threads, there's pretty much one per device. They're responsible for waking up, looking at what's in the page cache, and writing the dirty pages out for you. So what we do to offset the fact that there's probably going to be more dirty pages over time is we basically tell the flush daemon, you need to wake up sooner. I think the default is 10. Um, and what we say is when you know, 5% of the pages, the areas allocated for dirty pages is, is, is dirty, wake up and start doing work, right? So you sort of making the flush daemon be more proactive. Now, you guys are probably familiar with like operational analysis and steady state behavior. And the assumption is if you're overrunning your IO, you know, your IO capabilities all the time, you're not going to get ahead, right? We're not building an infinite queue here. So this does really well for high IO bursty applications where your IO sus subsystem, for the most part, can keep up over time. You don't want to just be on something that you, can, you can't get ahead on. So we're telling the, the flush daemon to wake up earlier. Um, and then we also set this uh, dirty expire sentisex. And um, so that's five minutes. The default configuration, I believe, is 30 seconds, which basically says, I do not want any dirty pages to be sitting in the page cache for more than 30 seconds. And so when the flush daemon wakes up, it makes a rush, and it has to start writing out all these dirty pages, and it does a sort of periodic, I think it becomes alive, and then it sleeps shortly. But what ends up happening is it's, you're putting a lot of pressure on the flush daemon to try to write much more aggressively, and so you can actually have a much bigger impact on your system. So if you open it up to five minutes, then the flush daemon can run a little more in a healthy fashion, and you don't see as much bursty I.O., 
and it takes into account that there's going to be more data to write, right? We said 60% of the, the page cache can be dirty pages. Um, and those tend to balance each other out. And these are all pretty low-level tunables, so you'll want to look at your characteristics, but the advanced tools will show you. I think um, FinCore is the command which lets you look at your, um, the entities in the page cache, and so you can determine the various states. So there's, there's tools out there to help evaluate all of this. Um, and then the last one, swappiness zero. We set that because we don't, have, we don't allocate any swap space on our systems, right? They're very single tenant. We don't plan on overloading them. Um, most of them are just Java apps uh, running with like Tomcat. And so the kernel doesn't need to waste any time trying to think about if it should even swap somebody out because you don't have any swap space. So if you don't use swap space, just set this and then your kernel doesn't have to spend time thinking about it. I don't have any hard numbers to share on this. We're still doing some tuning on Cassandra under various conditions, but Hopefully, um, we'll get it out in a tech blog or something so people can see some, some real data around that. Okay, block layer tuning. Um, how am I on time, by the way? Is 40 -ish, we're like 40-ish minutes into it? Okay, let's speed up a little bit. So the block tuning layer. So um, this has three or four things that I was gonna mention. So one is the scheduler. Uh, you know, when you're running on AWS and you're in a Zen container, you're not really determining your write pattern down at the file system level or down at the device level, right? The, uh, the Zen layer, the DOM0 and others are actually handling your write scheduling for you. And so in most cases, you run with the no-op scheduler, which is just a FIFO write model. Like, I'm just gonna jam my data into the, into the underlying system. They're gonna determine how to best write it because most likely, if I spend a bunch of time trying to reorder the write request to make them efficient at the disk level, it's all gonna be torn apart by what other, lever, what other layers are down there. So the no-op algorithm is really good, especially for SSD-based systems. And then the number of requests you can have in the pipe. So basically, when you're pushing data down um, into the file system, there are buffers that maintain at each device level um, how many requests are allowed to be queued up. And if you ever do IOSTAT and you see the average queue size, um, I think the default is 128. And so once you get above 128, you sort of have to back off and um, the block layer will actually sort of do some sorting on that and try to merge certain things as it goes down to the device system. This has a more significant impact on um, spinning disk system versus SSD because you're actually giving more data to the block layer that lets it do a more efficient ordering of writes, which translates usually into better efficiency at your I.O. level. Um, and then read ahead basically says, if you're going out to get me data, go ahead and get more of it. If anybody's worked with Oracle and has ever heard of like, you know, multi-block file I.O. read count or something, like when you get your time on your disk, you really want to use it, so you want to fetch more data. Um, and then the last one, RQ Affinity, this really deals with steering of soft interrupts. So when you issue a request from your process and it goes down through the block layer, it makes it to the device driver layer, um, and your device is bound to a certain CPU on your system, and you'll probably see the IRQ rate on that CPU, if you're heavy on I.O., just always getting hammered. Well, on the round trip, when the request is coming back up from the device driver layer, and it's dispatched to the block layer for queuing, the default behavior is that that return IRQ, the soft IRQ, be handled on the same processor the I.O. was scheduled on for the device. Um, this is another one of the cool parameters. I believe this was a, uh, added by Google um, into the kernel. And a lot of these aren't enabled by default. But what it basically uh, it maintains like a hash table, and when the request comes back, it actually dispatches it back to the process, the, the core on which the original I.O. request was issued. And so you end up getting better CPU cache usage. Um, mileage may vary, but as the processor speed has sort of slowed down and its rate of increase, but the number of cores has gone up, if you're on a system where you see a large amount of IRQ processing load, heavy, you know, hard or soft, this type of parameter can really spread out your distribution of that, and you can see some big performance gains. Memory allocation tuning. This, one's, this is more of a reliability one. Um, by default, Linux will over-allocate memory. People will say, give me 20 gigs, and they'll say, great, there's 20 gigs. It doesn't actually care if it has 20 gigs in the future for you. You might go and get to the point where you actually need 20 gigs, and then there's some... My understanding is there's a mechanism where it'll go around and start killing some processes to make sure you get your memory. So if you're in our environment, we are running, you know, we have a large heap um, uh, Java process in most cases. We want it to have all of its memory allocated to it all the time, and we don't want to get into a situation where we can't get the allocation we need. This basically says, be very strict about the allocation of memory when somebody asks for it and make sure that it exists. Um, and it's a combination of uh, what's available in swap and what's in your physical memory, and we don't run with swap, so it's really what's available in physical. Although in order to prevent someone from doing like a DDoS or overrunning your system, there is a parameter which says, okay, I'll give you a lot of memory and I'll guarantee it, but it can't be more than a certain percentage of physical memory because you're probably trying to do something nasty on our system like force all the other processes out through the same behavior. 
And so if you set the ratio to 80, that means that at any time a given process could actually request up to 80% of physical memory for itself, and it will mark it out. Um, you might hit that if you set it to the strict sort of the strict model, and then you don't raise that ratio. I think the default is like 40. I'm not sure you have to check on your system, but it just it just adds more reliability. You aren't going to have those out of memories uh, problems. So network stack tuning. Um, this is something we're working on quite a bit, and this this first parameter. TCP slow start after idle. Are people familiar with that parameter? Okay, it's sort of been a thorn in a lot of people's side for some time. Um, Scott on my team here did some research uh, when we were splitting our traffic between west and east, and we were seeing some behaviors that we weren't expecting because we use a lot of connection pooling. We have an open source product called, or open source uh, component called Ribbon. It's a lot of our IPC maintains connection pools, you know, does t uh, retries. And so, you know, the latency, I think, was about, or the round trip was about 80 milliseconds for us. But what we were seeing was occasionally we'd have these spikes, and they would be like 170 to 200 milliseconds. And we're like, what, you know, what the hell is going on? Um, and so we really dug into it. Scott knows all the details. I don't know all the details. But basically what happens if you have a Keep Alive connection that's over a wide area network, and it's not necessarily busy that often. When I say busy, it isn't, um, it isn't like it has to be idle for a second. It has to be idle for like one or two round trips, like maybe 80 milliseconds. And when that happens, it kicks the connection back into slow start mode and you have to ramp back up again. So what was happening is we had these connection pools and under periods of low load, the connection only has to be idle for a couple hundred milliseconds. Then it would get kicked back into slow start mode and we, slow start mode, and we would incorporate more round trips just to warm it up again. This basically says, don't do that. Just keep the congestion window, whatever it was, and don't kick me back to a lower level. I think. Google, a bunch of other massive you know, web presence people, they just set this by default, um, but it wasn't, it wasn't pushed down. The TCP fin timeout. So if you have an application that has a high rate of socket churn from your clients, and your server itself or your application is in charge of tearing down the connection, um, once you close that connection on the client, it goes into a certain state, I think, fin weight. This parameter says that um, uh, the amount of time that that's allowed to wait, wait in that state so you don't run out, you know, and you set it lower so you don't run out of sockets. That can be a problem where you're on this high connection churn rate um, and you run out of sockets. So that's something we said a little bit lower. Uh, TCP early transmit. So this is based on a, a Google paper, paper, and Google did a bunch of extensions in this area. There's actually a lot of really cool uh, Linux tunables that came from Google which are not enabled by default, right? Because just like we serve a few movies, they serve a few web pages, um, but probably a little scale above us as well. And so the early retransmits, by default, um, you know, when you're, when you're communicating with someone over a TCP conversation, if you receive a duplicate ax, um, the default TCP behavior is to try to determine if that behavior is actually a result of out of order packet delivery or if there's actual loss. And so normally what it does is it waits around and it waits for like three of them to arrive. And it's like, okay, now I know what the problem is. And it like sends a packet or takes whatever necessary recovery. Um, and Google uh, did some studies, especially in parts of the world where they had lower network uh, performance and stability. And they determined that their applications were spending a lot of time waiting on either packet loss or out of order delivery um, when they should have just automatically sent another packet back to the client to get it going. And so this actually lowers it and says, instead of waiting for three uh, acts, you know, um, yeah, three acts on the same packet. Uh, we just wait for two, so you're actually doing more of an early retransmit, um, and it reduces some of the wait time you get on the other side. The rest of these, I don't think I'm gonna have time to go into much depth on. Um, the one that I do wanna talk about is basically the last two on the right, or at least the last one. So the other ones have to do with how much you wanna put in your network queue. Another one determines how much network can be taken off the wire and queued up for you to service before you start rejecting that. So if you're on a, you know, a 10 gigabit, uh, system, like you're running on a high 1.4x large, you're on a CC2, a lot of the ones, especially with the new instances coming out with really awesome network characteristics around throughput, you might want to revisit if you're a network intensive application that your queues are sized appropriately for handling that workload. Um, and then the last one, just like I talked about with the IRQ handling, how you can distribute it across multiple cores, the same mechanism exists um, for network traffic. And I believe this, again, was probably introduced by Google. I could be wrong. But basically, if you have a very network-intensive application, when the packets are coming back, it makes an effort to actually service that interrupt back on the core on which the request was previously initiated. So if you're just doing a huge amount of network traffic, this can have some big value if you're on a larger core system. I mean, if you're running on like a T1 micro, it's probably not a big deal, but if you're running on like, you know, a CC2 or, you know, a high one and you have a lot of ECUs, it'll probably bring you more value, so 
mileage may vary, you know, measure it. And the other ones have to do with the amount of, you know, the buffer sizes around TCP handling, but they're all tweakable, and I think now that we're getting more members in the instance classes, you should evaluate them independently and make sure they're not a bottleneck for you. Um, okay, tuning roadmap. So as I indicated, I would say that Netflix is more at the beginning than the middle or the end of its AMI tuning exercise. Um, we've just started it this year, and there's a lot of different workloads. We're currently undergoing a move from a CentOS-based image to more of an Ubuntu-based model. Um, we don't have a lot of the utilities available we would like because of how we've configured certain things. So um, over the next, say, six to 12 months, I think there's going to be a lot more data we're pushing out about how we've optimized for various workloads. We're going to probably start working with the encoding team and some other teams as well to see how we can tune those workloads that really push the, push the instance type. So future tuning activity. Um, I think this was a real key point that Thor brought up before. You know, we've had the perennial argument at Netflix of H HVM versus PV. And it's very difficult to get an apples to apples comparison because so few instance types will support both types of the VM. Well, now you have this flexibility where let's say you're running memcache and you're on a C3 or you're on an M, probably wouldn't be good, but say you're on like a, an M3 of some sort. Um, you can actually run HVM with PV drivers and PV and actually do apples to apples and determine which one's best for your characteristics. I know Intel talked yesterday about instance type selection and certain, I think it was SSL or some other security related uh, embedded capability in the processor, and I believe that might have only really been available if you're on HVM. So you have to, you have to do your trade-offs, but the fact that the PV drivers are available for HVM eliminates some of the limitations on being HVM around optimized I.O. behavior. Uh, so we're going to be looking at all these things. We're going to study, do some more Cassandra studies. We're going to tune the block schedulers, pretty much everything I uh, talked to you about. We don't have a lot of file system intensive applications. I mean, Cassandra's pretty, pretty heavy, but you know, with ButterFS coming out, um, it's really a top-notch file system, but I think there's some mixed opinion over whether it's stable enough for most people's production environments, but, you know, it's on the way. Um, uh, and the next one, in terms of the network performance, we're going to evaluate that at our different tiers. And that's, yeah, proportional rate reduction. That's the name of the paper from Google if you want to search for it, but there's a really great study on how this early retransmit behavior just buys them a lot. Um, and then we're just going to capture more data. Ammer wrote that line, so we're going to capture a lot more data, um, which, which is not unusual for us. So that's really it. Now, there's a gigantic appendix in this that's probably about 50 pages, where it talks about detailed tool usage and goes into a little more depth on, um, on some of the settings I talked about. So I couldn't cover it today, but more detail you want, go ahead and hit that. And if you find anything that you think is inaccurate or is more another data point that would be valuable for us, please let us know. You know I don't want to waste time looking at things with the wrong setting. Um, but I think we have about 10 minutes for questions. So, Thor, do you want to come up? I'll share the bullets with you. Um, oh, one thing I forgot to mention, I'm hiring. Is anybody else hiring here? <laughs> so my performance team needs some performance engineers. So if you're interested in working on really big, scary stuff, let me know. <laughs>